Hi, everybody. It's, um, it's, um, it's really cool to be here in Atlanta, uh, which was the city that I was first hired to the Wall Street Journal to work in. So I lived here for a couple of years from 1992 to 1994, and I see my housemate right in the second row, Beth. Um, uh, I, I remember when I was first uh, uh, assigned to, I had just been hired at the Wall Street Journal, and I was faking business reporting, doing Coca-Cola earnings like I knew and liked it. Um, uh, and I really enjoyed my, um, my time here. I was really nervous, too, though, about coming out to talk tonight, uh, just because, you know, I cover foreign policy for the New York Times. So I'm used to talking to audiences about foreign policy. I'm just not used to talking about myself. But I remember I had uh, my, one of my first editors uh, in the Atlanta Bureau, uh, Glenn Rufinak, used to say that it's the fear that makes it good. So if that's the case, tonight is going to rock. <laughs> um, about eight years ago, uh, it was a really hot Friday afternoon, and I, me and a couple of friends busted out of work early and decided to drive over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge to look for crabs to eat crabs. Uh, we got there and we're sitting at this divey crab shack uh, and the sun is setting and we're very pleased with ourselves. And I started talking to them about how, as it turns out, uh, my ancestors are, were from, some of my ancestors were from the eastern shore of, of Maryland and Virginia. And they knew, my friends knew I was from Liberia, but they didn't know the history and they started asking me questions. And I told them about my great, 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 great grandfather who was on the first ship of freed slaves that went back to found Liberia, about how my ancestors went to Africa from the United States, the free blacks or the free men as they called themselves, and forged a new country, and also how in many ways they set up the same kind of antebellum society that they had fled from in the pre-Civil pre War uh, America. Now my friends are reporters and they're firing question after question at me and I you know I told them about how in 1980 you know I was born into uh, what passed for the ruling elite in Liberia and in 1980 there was a coup the government was overthrown and a lot of my family was attacked and we ran away to the United States um, and I remember Neil and Shayla looking at me and saying you're a reporter why haven't you written about this and I gave them the same answer that I've given a lot of people when they've asked me this question. Uh, it's complicated, I said to them. Now that's not much of an answer, but it's all that I had at the time. Uh, because in telling them sort of the Cliff Notes version of my story, I'd left out one small detail, my sister Eunice. I knew that I could never actually get around to writing my own story until I reconciled myself with my separation from the sister I had grown up with when we fled Liberia and had figured out a way to, to go back first and find her. When I was seven years old, my father built a big house on the beach in the Atlantic Ocean in Liberia, 11 miles outside of Monrovia. It was a 22-room monument to the 1970s. Um, awesome, huge, you know, seven bedrooms. I see my brother who was here tonight, uh, and we were all in this, you know, huge house. And I was very excited because um, I had my, um, for the first time, I had my own room. It was a pink bedroom. And I was very excited. I was seven years old, but I was terrified at night to sleep by myself. I had all these imaginary spirits and. Hartman and Niji and all these things going on in my head. Uh, so my parents went and they found me a companion, an 11-year-old girl, who they brought to our house to raise, to be my sister. My book, The House at Sugar Beach, is the story of how Eunice and I, is about our family and how Eunice and I were raised together, about the coup that overtook the government and turned Liberia around in 1980 about our separation and about my decision 23 years later to go back and try to find her. So I think I'll start with a couple of pages from when Eunice first got to 
our house. Sugar Beach, 1974. Eunice came to Sugar Beach on a hot, muggy afternoon. After mommy put out the word that her eight-year-old daughter needed a live-in playmate, Eunice's mother, a basso woman of little means, was quick to respond. The rickety yellow taxi, its front covered in rust, came clattering down the dirt road to our house, hesitating briefly at the gate before driving up to the front. What you mean some girl just come here to stay with people? I had demanded of mommy earlier, after she let it drop that I was getting a new sister. This was not happy news. I did not appreciate at all the idea of some stranger having my, of having my turf invaded by a foreigner. Having my little sister Marlene around was bad enough. So I was sulking in the TV lounge with one ear cocked for the sounds of vehicles approaching Sugar Beach when I heard the clackety clack of a car engine as it rattled into the yard. I raced to Marlene's window. From my perch there, I saw three people getting out of the car. First, there was a woman in full basa attire, lapa skirt with a bright red shirt and a head tie scarf. She looked nervous. Next was a nondescript man wearing gray wool trousers and a shirt. He reached into the taxi and pulled out a gangly looking girl also wearing a lapa, long skinny legs. She looked terrified. Mommy came out onto the porch to welcome them and I immediately followed to investigate, peering at the girl. On the way out, I grabbed an orange with its top cut off from the bowl where Old Man Charlie had them. I squeezed the rest of the orange into my mouth, massaging the skin to coax out the juice. It gave me something to do while I studied my new sister. She stood with one hand behind her back, holding the other arm. She looked to be about 11 years old. She had a high forehead and huge eyes. Between the pair of them, you could hardly see anything else on her face. She stood with her legs slightly apart, but even so, I could tell that she was bow-legged, a plus in my mind, since I longed to be bow-legged, too. She didn't look happy to be there. My name is Helene Calista Esmeralda Estelores Dennis Cooper, I announced, finally taking the depleted orange out of my mouth. I was wearing Wrangler jeans that my father had brought for me from the United States. My name is Eunice Patrice Bull, she stuttered. We inspected each other while Mommy and Eunice's mother and uncle talked. For Eunice's mother, this was one of those things you did because you love your child. She knew that Eunice would have a better shot at life with us than she would living in her zinc shack with her, where there was no electricity, no running water, and no inside toilet. She was struggling to come up with the money every year to send Eunice to school. She had another son and numerous adopted children, strays picked up along the way, to feed. For all that she would miss her daughter, this wasn't really much of a decision. Native Liberians routinely jumped at the chance to have their children reared by Congo families. And in Liberia in 1974, it was the chance of a lifetime to leave a poor country family and move in with the Coopers. Eventually, Mommy turned to me. Show Eunice her room, she said. I had no idea what it was like to live in a shack, or even that Sugar Beach's opulence might be a shock to Eunice, but I was more than happy to show off our custom-built house. Deciding to start on the lower level, so Eunice could properly appreciate the scope and grandeur of Sugar Beach, I went around the house to the rarely used front door on the ocean side. The door was locked. My face burning with embarrassment, I left her standing next to the porch railing and scurried back around the house to where Mommy and Mrs. Bull were still talking next to the taxi. I raced up the kitchen stairs, ran into the house, and clattered back down the stairwell to the front door, opening the door for Eunice from the inside. You can come in now, I said, standing aside, breathless and feeling foolish. Eunice trailed after me as I turned and walked through the paneled tunnel that led to our recreation room. She took in Daddy's bar, the playroom with our stereo set, and the toy room with all of its dollhouses, teddy bears, and games. What down there? she asked, pointing down the hall. Daddy guest room, I said. That way I sleep in? No, you upstairs. My sister Jenny used to sleep there when she came home from England, I said, adding proudly, she's a binto. This new girl had better be taking note that there was no, this was no flimflack family she was moving in with, I thought. We had a sister who went to boarding school in England. Eunice trailed behind me as I glided up the stairs to present to her the middle level of our house, with its kitchen, dining room, music room, and sunken living room. Finally, we headed to the top level with the bedrooms, bathrooms, and TV lounge. I slid Eunice a sideways glance before I started 
talking color. Liberian slang for putting on airs by speaking with, a, with an American accent. This is my mommy's room and this is my daddy's room, I said, walking units by my parents' bedroom. That's my yucky sister Marlene's room. We continued down the hall. And this, I said with a flourish, opening the door to what would be Eunice's bedroom, is your room. You're across from me. If you get scared at night, you can come sleep in my room. Eunice just walked into her room and sat on the bed. She looked like she wanted to cry, so I left her alone. Unsurprisingly to any of you, we did not get along at first. I, was, I, read, I go back and I look at this, and it's amazing to me just how much of a brat I was. Um, uh, but I think the pressure of Eunice and I being thrust together, too, kind of uh, freaked us both out. You know, we were supposed to, I knew she was supposed to be there for me, and I was supposed to be there for her. And it took a, it took a long time for, it took some time for that to happen. The first person that Eunice bonded with was my youngest sister, Marlene, who was by now three. Uh, Marlene loved Eunice, and Eunice loved Marlene. And the two of them would go and lock themselves up in Marlene's room. And I could hear they're playing their stupid games in there, running around. And I'd stew outside in the hallway in my room, like barely angry, stewing in my own bitter bitterness. Um, eventually, though, fear brought us together because we were kids, and we were in this big house, and we were in the middle of the bush as far as I was concerned. And... We were terrified. We had rogues coming all the time to steal my, you know, the ivory that my parents bought, um, breaking in at night and that sort of thing. And we eventually realized that none of us wanted to sleep in our own rooms by ourselves. And so we all started dragging mattresses into Marlene's bedroom and sleeping on the floor. And that's sort of how we kind of bonded and got to be, you know, became, started liking each other. And Eunice would tell these Amazing stories. Liberia has a great and rich history. I mean, it's founded by freed blacks from the United States, but still at its heart, it's very African. And Eunice would tell the scariest stories in the middle of the night about Hartman and Niji and the underwater spirits that would suck you under in the lagoon if you went in there at Sugar Beach and take you off and you'd never be seen again. And I'd lie there just like chattering, but just terrified but loving every second of it. Um, we lived together for six, seven years. Um, and writing this book, uh, you know, when I look back at sort of what I enjoyed and what I did enjoy by writing the book, writing this book was really hard uh, uh, at some parts because I felt like in many times I was revisiting the most painful parts of my history, uh, parts that I hadn't dealt with in the past, uh, like the day, for instance, that the soldiers came to Sugar Beach and my mother sacrificed herself for us. Uh, the day that my cousin Cecil was executed, executed on the beach, uh, the day that my father, my father died. Um, those were the, probably the hardest parts of writing the book because I feel like, you know, you're picking at a scab uh, and it heals over and then you go back and, you know, you have to pick some more. How did you feel? What happened? And all of that. Um, but there were also parts of writing this book that I loved. Um, there are parts that made me happy, revisiting parts of my life that, you know, when growing up in Liberia, that was really just extremely sweet to me. Um, for instance, chapter 12. Sugar Beach, Liberia, 1979. August 1979 to May 1980. My ninth grade year at the American Cooperative School, Old Road, Monrovia, Liberia, West Africa, encapsulated everything that would be part one of my life. It's all there. The taste of the tuck biscuits, a more buttery, salty version of Ritz crackers that I ate for lunch every day when I walked to the shop across the street from school. The smell of the bleachers in the ACS gymnasium, turpentine mixed with rubber. The feel of my green linen blouse that I always seem to be wearing during the big events of that year from the Sadie Hawkins dance to the Miss ACS beauty pageant to the night of May 16th when we ran to Roberts Field and ran away. All I have to do is close my eyes, and I'm 13 years old again. I have one best friend, Eunice, and lots of other friends, a place in the school choir, a permanent seat on the in-crowd trips to the beach on Saturdays, and a crush on Philip Clarence Parker IV. He was simpatico, a word mommy used when she wanted to show that she knew a little Italian. 
Philip was definitely simpatico. He was from an old Congo family, the son of Philip Clarence Parker III, a banker who was the treasurer of the Truwick Party and founder of Parker Paint. His mother, a pharmacist, was from the Bright family, which boasted a couple of government ministers. Philip was athletic. He was a starting forward on the ACS boys varsity basketball team. He was smart. A senior at ACS, he was planning to major in chemical engineering when he graduated and went to college in America. He and his brother Richard had basically been around all my life. Philip was three years older than Richard, and Richard and I were born one month apart. Richard had been in my class at ACS since the fourth grade. Everyone called Philip PCP, from the cool guys who hung out in front of the shop across the street to the cool teenage girls who all seemed to have crushes on him. I had heard that PCP was some kind of drug, so I always laughed in what I hoped was a sophisticated manner when people said, there's PCP, and Philip walked into a room. He was always smiling. He had one of those shy smiles that crinkled his eyes and made him look as if he wasn't sure he really wanted to talk to him, but if you did, why then he'd be overjoyed to talk to you. He was fierce, Liberian English for good looking, five foot 11 with a chocolate complexion and a really cute tight butt and a washboard stomach and one dimple. Yes, Helene, Eunice said one night as I regaled her with Philip's virtues. You not talk about his smiling eyes. You not talk about his tight butt. You not talk about his dimple. Please, please, please leave people alone about PC. PC was another one of Philip's nicknames, in case PCP was too long to say. We were hanging out in my room listening to my new record player. Eunice and I were both enthralled with the latest disco songs. The song we both loved the most was I Don't Love You Anymore by Teddy Pendergrass. It was dramatic, filled with declarative sentences. In front of the mirror in my bedroom, Eunice and I practiced how we planned to get boyfriends and then sack them. I had no intention of ever sacking Philip in the unlikely event that I even got him to notice me, but I played along with Eunice anyway. I'm sorry, we practiced saying, tossing our heads. It's like Teddy Pendergrass said. I just don't love you anymore. <laughs> Eunice actually got to carry out our plan. She chose the perfect moment after school as the Haywood kids were milling around with the ACS kids on Old Road. Her boyfriend, James Sirleaf, a fellow classmate at Haywood, was innocently buying orange Fanta and cola nuts at the shop across the street from the schools. Eunice had been going out with James for a whole month, so it was long past time for her to sack him anyway. He was nice enough, but boring, never having anything much to say beyond how beautiful he thought it, Eunice was. Any guy worth his salt should have known that was a perfect recipe to be sent to the shed. Adding to James's disfavor, Eunice, like me, had identified a new love. At the same time I decided Philip Parker was for me, Eunice decided she was in love with Sharif Abdallah, a wealthy Congo Mandingo boy. Sharif was tall and lanky with chocolate skin and an afro, and he talked in a really low voice as if he was too cool to have vocal cords. <laughs> he, winked at Eunice's, he winked at Eunice occasionally when we were at the movies on Saturdays, and he asked her to dance at Phil's party a couple of weeks before. They danced one fast record, but that was enough for Eunice. After much practicing at home with me at night, she was ready for the dramatic encounter with poor James. Still wearing her school uniform, yellow shirt and black skirt, she strode across the street to the shop, trailed by me, Marlene, Vicky, and a few ACS friends. James, come here, I need to talk to you. <laughs> James never knew what hit him. Before he could open his mouth, Eunice was off and running. It's over, she said, I found true love. <laughs> huh? James said, you and me are finished. Please don't be sad, it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> James started to talk. Eunice and I had practiced the night before for when he tried to talk. She was spectacular. Stop! She interrupted, holding up her hand in a dramatic stop gesture. In the name of love, I can't listen anymore. It's too painful. <laughs> With that, she turned in a glorious flounce and strode to Fidelis in the waiting Mercedes. We followed, poking each other in the ribs. How fantastic. Outside my little bubble, Congo country tensions were heating up. More and more now, people seemed to be staking out what side they were on. All of a sudden, some Congo people were claiming that they were country, declaring tribal affiliations like a badge of honor. Don't call me Congo, my grandma not vi woma, my cousin Siru actually had the gall to say to me. Oh, give me a break, Siru, I said. But I muttered, I got country blood too. 
I beg you, y'all, she hooted. I said, Eunice, get who said she country, they rare copa girl. Eunice just laughed. A few months before that, there have been rice riots in Liberia, uh, April 14th, where a lot of people have been uh, killed. The police opened, uh, arm, opened fire on unarmed protesters. So politically, uh, tensions were really heating up in Liberia. President Talbert and the Liberian ruling group were getting ready for the trial of Gabriel Bacchus Mathis. The post-OAU truce between Talbert and Mathis had ended after Mathis' PAL registered at a pol as a political opposition party. I am tired of being Mr. Nice Guy, Talbert announced. I will be tough and mean from, and rough from now on. Talbert tapped his constituents and delegations from various branches of his True Week party troop from upcountry to pledge their allegiance and show their support for Talbert. They demanded that Matthews and others be tried for treason. They demanded that Liberia declare itself a one-party state under True Week party leadership. Talbert responded by banning the PPP and PAL and rounded up 38 political dissidents, including Matthews, who he, tried, who he charged with sedition. Also arrested was Chair Chipu, a native Liberian ingrate if ever there was one, as far as the Congo people were concerned. Chair Chipu was the foster son of the hardline Minister of Justice, Joseph Chesson. Chipu had been raised in Chesson's house until he decided to join the PPP. So Chesson had his son arrested. Talbert set the treason trials of Matthews, Chipu, and the rest of the adjutants for April 14, 1980, the one-year anniversary of the Rice Riots. I was experimenting with a different way to wear my hair on the day that Philip carried my books to the car after school. We hadn't said a word to each other since the memorable slow dance at the Sadie Hawkins dance weeks earlier, and I was getting increasingly frustrated with the slow pace of my love affair. I had parted my hair in the middle with a pigtail on the top quarter and the remaining three quarters hanging around my face. It was a hairstyle style that I had seen Kelly on Charlie's Angels wear. Mommy had been picking me up after school every day that week because she didn't trust me and Eunice to come straight home with Fidelis. I was in the doghouse because my entire ninth grade class, except Janine Padmore and freakishly Richard Parker, had all got D's in Algebra 1. Mommy went nuts and told me I was grounded for a year. Then she started picking me up after school herself, as if that would somehow translate into an A in Algebra. I was walking away from my locker after school when I saw Philip coming out of Miss Ross's music class. I quickly darted my eyes away, as I usually did around him, but this time he walked right up to me and put his arm around me. You look cute today, Cooper, he said, smiling. I was tongue-tied. As we got near the gate, he reached over and took my school books. Those look heavy, he said, that same smile. I finally found my voice and started blabbering something about how good he had been at the basketball game the other day and how I love watching him play and what an avid basketball fan I was. We're getting closer and closer to the car now. I realized with dismay that Mommy, Eunice, and Marlene were already sitting there watching us approach, slack-jawed. Eunice was beaming. I was playing for you, Philip said. He opened the car door, kissed my mother hello, smiled at Marlene and Eunice, and handed me my books. He closed the door and leaned through the window and kissed me on my cheek. I tried to turn my mouth toward him, but I wasn't quick enough. <laughs> then he jogged away, back toward the school. The whole car was quiet for about 10 seconds. And then I scrunched up my face and let out a war whoop. Four days later, during the early morning hours of April 12, 1980, like native Liberian enlisted soldiers led by 28-year-old Master Sergeant Samuel Kayan Doe stormed the executive mansion, disemboweled the president, overthrew the Congo regime, and upended my world. We ran away a month after that. Um, Liberia, we left Eunice behind. She said that she did not want to come with us because she was about to graduate. And I don't know, I don't think my mom really pushed the issue. We had been trauma, we were pretty traumatized at the time. Um, it was almost impossible for me to believe when we left that I wouldn't be seeing Eunice again. I think I thought that she would be coming to join us soon. All of a sudden, though, I'd gone from sort of the spoiled, privileged princess, 
was, you know, most popular girl at my school in Liberia to the suspicious African refugee at my American public high school in Knoxville, Tennessee. From my perch in the corner of the Holston High School Library, I either worked on my romance novel or continued my letters to Eunice. I was hanging out in the library because I didn't have any friends, and so during lunch period, I didn't want to sit in the cafeteria by myself. My letters were as imaginative as the Harlequin I was working on, glowingly describing my new life and make-believe friends. I painted a story of a life that echoed the American dream as we had imagined it to be from Liberia. My imaginary relationship with Junior Lowry progressed to his escorting me to homecoming. Junior was on the basketball team, and I had made the cheerleading squad. He was always taking me for ice cream after practice. We had started making out, but he'd only gotten to second base so far. I was always turning down dates from other guys who found me exotic. I was trying to stay faithful to Junior, but it was hard because so many of the boys at Holston were chasing after me. In the real world, Junior was on the basketball team. He was in my geometry class and had smiled at me once. Each week, I left my letters on the dining room table and Mommy mailed them during the day. Eunice could read me like the cheap novels we both loved. Hey, Helen, you know you're not no cheerleader, she wrote back. Eunice's letters were written in red ink. She was sleeping at night with a wet towel on her chest because her mother's house had no air conditioning. Bar Henry had driven her back to Monrovia the night after our Pan Am flight departed Robertsfield Airport. It was almost 2 a.m. when they stopped at Sugar Beach. There were no servants there when Eunice and Braw Henry stopped by. They had collected their paychecks, said their goodbyes, and struck off to try to figure out for themselves how to traverse the new landscape of post-Congo Liberia. In the pitch black night, Eunice and Braw Henry hauled her bags to his car, filling up the trunk in the back seat. Braw Henry locked the house up behind them, the triumph of hope over experience. Rogues came to Sugar Beach regularly when the family was there. There was no way the house would be unviolated now that it was empty of the family, with those soldiers patrolling the countryside. Eunice looked behind her as they drove away, but without any lights left on, it was hard to see the house in the dark. It disappeared quickly from view. Bra Henry drove the 11 miles to Sinkhor, dropped Eunice off at her mother's house, and headed back to his own house nearby. He had no intention of leaving Liberia. He'd be damned if any country people were going to run him out of his country. He was Captain Dennis's son, after all. After six years of living with the Coopers, Eunice was back to being Basel, living again with her mother and five other cousins and adopted kids in her mother's small house in Sincor. How do you re-become what you were six years before? Can you erase six years? Mrs. Bull tiptoed around Eunice like she was a fragile flower. Her daughter was used to the best after living with the Coopers. Mrs. Bull felt she was under pressure to keep Eunice in the style she believed she had become accustomed to. She put aside the plumpest and juiciest crawfish from the cassava leaf in the afternoon for Eunice because, she told the brood of stray children who hung around the house looking for handouts, there was now a VIP living there, Mrs. Cooper's daughter. She called Eunice Mrs. Cooper's daughter. Eunice's mother told the other kids in the house to make sure that they left the good rice for Mrs. Cooper's daughter. She spent her scarce money on shampoo and conditioner because, she told one and all, she knew Mrs. Cooper's daughter was used to having real shampoo, not the rough caustic soda soap that many Liberians used. In December 1980, seven months after moving back to her mother's house, Eunice graduated from high school at Haywood. Graduation day was steamy, especially under the black cap and gown she had to wear. Sitting among her classmates at Haywood, she spotted two familiar faces in the crowd of proud relatives watching the graduates. One was her mother, the other was Bra Henry. Bra Henry came to my graduation, Eunice wrote me. She added proudly, he gave me $40. I read the letter enviously. Eunice had graduated from high school. Freedom lay ahead. Nobody could tell her what to do anymore. Nobody could force her to live in Knoxville, hundreds and hundreds of miles from the ocean. Being in Knoxville felt like straddling two worlds. There was my physical world, with the monotony of going to a school every day where no one talked to me, and coming home to watch General Hospital with Marlene, and, occasionally, and occasional trips to Sizzlin Steakhouse with Mommy. At night, Daddy called from North Carolina with updates about his new job as an accountant with a company in Durham. 
We could never talk long on the phone, though, because it was long distance. And those calls cost 10 cents a minute unless you called after 11 p.m. When we lived at Sugar Beach, if you wanted to talk to somebody, we went to their house. Then there was the world in my head, the one in Liberia, pre-April 12, 1980. That was the world I care about, the world that I miss so much. That was the world filled with beautiful, ripe smells of dried fish and tropical flowers. That world was filled with people I knew and people who knew me. It was filled with a deep-to-the-bone knowledge that I was somebody and I came from somewhere, a world that Elijah Johnson and Randolph Cooper and my ancestors had built from scratch through blood and sweat. Over the next few years, Liberia sort of descended into the ninth circle of hell with one civil war after another. Uh, Doe was finally killed uh, by another, not by Charles Taylor, but by a warring uh, rebel, Prince Johnson. Uh, and the images coming out of Liberia were, were horrific. Um, I went through a sort of increasing disconnect where the more I saw what was happening in Liberia, the more I felt like the only way I could deal with it was to shut it out. After my father died um, and my mother, who had gone back to Liberia, ran away back again to the U.S. Um, and so many of my relatives died there. I'd watch the TV news and see what was coming, and I felt like if I killed everybody in my head who was still left in Liberia, then I couldn't be hurt when they died, which is a really cowardly way to sort of live your life as complete denial. I became a reporter, first with the Providence Journal, then with the Wall Street Journal, and eventually the New York Times. And I traveled all over the world writing about wars and, you know, conflict and all sorts of things, everything except um, Liberia, which I basically abandoned in my head. Uh, people ask me what when did I finally decide that I had to write this book? And it's something that has sort of been inside me for, had been inside me for 23 years that I knew I wasn't dealing with the way I should, that my whole part of my, my whole part in the history of Liberia I had not dealt with. Um, but there actually was a catalyst. There was a moment for me when I realized that all the choices I had made up to that point um, had been, not wrong is too strong a word, but they made no sense. Uh, for me, that time came in 2003 in April and in Iraq, in the Iraqi desert. And this is the last passage that I'll read. It was dark and we were traveling back black without headlights so the Iraqis couldn't see us. I was embedded with, the, I was one of the embedded reporters with the 3rd Infantry Division during the invasion of Iraq. Everyone put on night vision goggles, which made it much easier to see, although they gave the air a greenish cast. I'd never before seen up close the actual bombing of a town, and the sight had my heart pounding. An explosion in the distance created a huge fireball. Who did that? I yelled at Chaplain Trogdon. Us or them? We're doing it to them, he said. Nearby, U.S. soldiers lobbed a torrent of 155-millimeter mm shells at Iraqi troops about nine miles away. There was frantic chatter over the radio. Do not stop. Do not stop. The convoy must keep moving. The message was clear. If the convoy stopped while bombing Iraqi positions, it would become a line of sitting ducks. Then the convoy stopped. For about 15 minutes, we just sat in line in the sand. In the Humvee, no one talked. On the radio, the screaming chatter continued. You must keep moving. Finally, we started moving again. A series of seven deafening sonic-like booms were just off to the left. At the wheel, Specialist Miller started cheering. The MLRSs, he yelled, clapping his hands. We had just used the multiple launch rocket system to fire 12 rockets containing cluster bombs on the Iraqis. As they landed, fireball after fireball exploded. I tried to drown out Specialist Miller's cheering and the sound of the shelling. My palms were sweating and I was getting overwrought. What must it feel like to be on the receiving end of all of this TNT? No sooner did that thought enter my head than our Humvee burst open in a thundering, violent crash. We were hit. My first thought was no thought. It was pain. 
A sudden searing, explosive pain in my back so intense I knew I was mortally hurt. My head was crushed into my spine. I couldn't breathe. There was yelling outside. It took me several moments to realize that I was the only one in what was left of the Humvee. Somehow both the chaplain and Specialist Miller were gone. I had been sitting in the back seat, but now my head was pinned to the steering wheel. There was a crushing weight on my back. Outside, shouting, Get her out of there! The only part of my body I could move were my fingers, which were pinned against my trousers. I felt a warm liquid oozing through my chem suit. Then someone was reaching into the Humvee to touch me. Then another yell. Medivac! Medivac! She's bleeding out! She's bleeding out! I can't move! I yelled. I was slowly realizing that I wasn't dead yet. We hadn't been hit by an Iraqi bomb. A tank, one of ours, had run over my Humvee, crushing the vehicle and pinning me to the wheel. Chaplain Trogdon and Specialist Miller, in the front seats, both got pushed out either side of the Humvee as it crumpled. I was not so lucky. Or was I? After what seemed like hours, but was more like just five minutes or so, somebody finally figured out that since the tank hadn't been so much as scratched, they could just back it up off from on top of me. A huge weight lifted off my back as the tank reversed. They pulled me out of the now-crushed Humvee and spread me on my back in the sand. Somebody began to examine me. And at that moment, as I lay in the sand in the desert, my chem suit soaked with what turned out to be oil, not blood. I thought of Liberia. I shouldn't die here, I thought. What a stupid place to die. What a stupid war to die in. If I'm going to die in a war, it should be my own country. I should die in a war in Liberia. So, thank you. Um, so, I guess I'll stop here. Um, I learned a lot of things about myself, uh, about my family, about my history while I was writing this book. It's probably... Um, it's definitely something that's been inside me for a long time. I spent an enormous amount of time unable to emotionally deal with what happened to my country after we left. Um, my decision 23 years later to go back to Liberia and to find my sister is probably singularly the most important thing that I've ever done. This book, I guess, is the rest of the story that I didn't tell my friends that day that we drove over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge for crabs. Um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come out tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. Thank you. What a great question. <laughs> I, yeah, I thought my parents were like trying to torture me because I wanted to be so close to the water and Knoxville is nowhere near the water. Um, uh, my uncle, uh, my mother's brother, had gone to school in the college in the United States and married a woman from Knoxville who he took back to Liberia. And after he died, she had moved back to Knoxville in the late 70s. And so when we ran away, it was the first place, you know, you go straight to where you know somebody, which is all refugees will sort of tell, you know, probably have a similar tale. And so we went to Knoxville. And we stayed there a year, and then my mother went back to Liberia and sent, my parents had divorced by that point, and sent us to live with my father, who was living in North Carolina at the time. Yes? I can't tell you that. I'll ruin the whole book for you. I gotta leave something. It's in there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. It's like, it's, I think so many people deal with things completely differently. You know, a lot of 
um, a lot of my Liberian friends or family did not necessarily do what I did, which is turn their back on Liberia. A lot of people, people deal with these sort of things. You know, everybody has their different coping, you know, coping mechanism. I mean, my oldest sister went back to Liberia and, you know, lived there for a while before, you know, the Charles Taylor war started and then she had to leave as well, but she went through hell getting out of Liberia and it's still, you know, she went through an incredibly different, difficult time. I also have friends, uh, you know, Philip Parker, who I write about, my 14 year old crush, uh, ran, he left Liberia, went to college and then went back and he still lives there and he says that, you know, he's, he's never, he's not willing to leave. He's, it's, he, he once told me he feels that he's not a social security number there no matter what's happening there. So there's some people, and I, I have a lot of admiration for people who are able to stay even as you see everything falling apart around you and who love a country so much that they'll stay and fight. I, I love Liberia too, but I don't, I've never been as brave as a lot of the people who, who stayed or who went back. Yes. When I went back in 2003, I stayed for a month. Yes, ma'am. That's, that's a really, um, it's taught me so much about myself. It's taught me about my, you know, let's just start, let's just start with the, the historic part of it. I grew up, my mom would tell us these stories about, you know, Elijah Johnson. And my dad would tell us stories about the four Cooper brothers who got on a ship in Norfolk, Virginia in 1829. Um, they were all, you know, free, free men at the time and went to Liberia. And my mother would talk about um, Elijah Johnson, who was her ancestor, who got on the first ship in New York in 1820 that went and ended up in Sierra Leone and then eventually in Liberia. And she would tell us, they, my parents would tell me these stories about them. And I heard them and I knew them and growing up, but it was sort of like, you don't really believe them because you know your parents telling you this stuff and you don't, I didn't have any tangible proof. And when I started working on the book, part of the research, I spent an enormous amount of time at the Library of Congress. And I found one day the journal that Elijah Johnson kept when he was on the ship in 1820 going back. And I still remember looking at the microfiche and I was, my hands were shaking as I'm like, and he's writing and he's writing what it's like on the ship. And he had this one line that just blew me away that said, today while we were up on deck, John Fisher whipped his wife. I think this is a very dull lamp for me to take to a dark continent, but I have faith in my God. And I thought, I mean, that just, it's just sort of, I felt like I was right there with him and he's on his way. He doesn't know what he's going into, into and he's worried about the people who are with him. And finding that and finding out so much tangible, I remember when I found the ship log for the Cooper brothers, uh, the four Cooper brothers that got on the ship in Norfolk in 1829 and seeing, you know, what they took with him, with them and all of that. It's just, it, it makes it so present and immediate. So that was one thing I like, I would have, if I hadn't done this book, I never would have like gone back and looked and found out, you know, all that I did about my ancestors who are, I'm so incredibly proud of, you know, I, they, 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 on one hand, they, they set up the same type of antebellum society that they had fled here, which, you know, was a horrible thing. And on the other hand, they fought, and if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be standing here right now. And so it's this, it's, it's, there's a lot of conflict that's like teaming up in me about it. And it was like one minute I'd be reading this and be horrified, and the next minute I'd be reading this, I'd be crying, and I'd be so, you know, I'd go from proud to like, you know, back and forth and back and forth and guilt and shame and pride and guilt and shame. It was just sort of, but it's kind of, I think that's what so many of us have, you know, I think it just shows the sort of the universality, I don't know, is that a word, of the, just the human condition, that we all are like, we, it, it just shows so much about how similar we all are, and we all have this in our past, and we all have people who made decisions and did things and helped us to get to where, where we are. And I think that's sort of the understanding that was probably the, the one thing I took from the book the most, just how deeply flawed and imperfect we all are, but still here we are. Yes.
Um, Liberia came about, the American, coloniz the American colonization of society was one of the uh, uh, sort of birth, this whole back to Africa movement uh, at the turn of the century, uh, the early 1800s. Um, there was this belief that you couldn't have, there was a growing class of freed blacks in the United States, it was in the United States and whatever, um, and you couldn't have freed blacks living in the country setting up an example for all the enslaved blacks because the slaves would then think that they could be free too. They thought it was a bad example. So it was a combination of sort of abolitionist people who wanted to end slavery in the north, but the slave owners in the south who sort of got together and the, their motives were all pretty mixed, but started this whole back to Africa, Africa movement and sent ship after ship. And this went on for several decades before they finally stopped somewhere around the 1860s or 1870s uh, in this back to Africa movement, but it was to, so they, they got to Sierra Leone first and they went from place to place looking for land to buy uh, from the Africans there and ended up with this patch of land that they bought, uh, paid $300 for, which was not a whole lot of money. Um, and there was immediate sort of conflict between the colonists and the native Africans who a lot of them at the time were still engaging in the slave trade. This was their source of economy, and uh, even though Britain had abolished the slave trade uh, at the time, uh, the colonists came and said, no, you can't, you know, we, 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 you, we, and they would recapture these slave ships as they went out to sea and take them back and free the slaves, and that was a lot of, you know, which was at the same time taking away the livelihood of the native Liberians, but they weren't going to stand there and allow slaving to continue to go on. So there was conflict between the two groups from the start. But Liberia has always been in the minds of Liberians at the very least, very, very tied to the United States you know, from, from the start. And so sort of when we first moved here, uh, I was 14 and I knew everything there was to know about the United States. So why didn't anybody know about me <laughs> when I got to Knoxville? And I remember people would say, where's Liberia? And I was like, hello, <laughs> you know, it's like I didn't understand. Um, so it was kind of a rude awakening. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, how do the uh, Liberians feel about the uh, present inspiration of international <laughs> I think they're probably as excited about it as everybody else around the world. Whenever I, I travel a lot with um, Condoleezza Rice, is the because I cover uh, diplomacy for the New York Times, and everywhere we go, um, we are asked. I'm asked. Uh, she is asked. I, I think she dodges the question, but I'm certainly asked <laughs> by. Um, <laughs> by people everywhere just about what, you know, about the presidential race and about, you know, Obama and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, and I would even, I remember we're in, you know, particularly when you go to Africa because Obama's father is from Kenya. So I think a lot of Africans in particular have a deep, you know, feel a lot of, of hope when they look at it, but they're also from the outside looking in, so. Yes, sir. Yeah. Are you kidding? It took me four years, it took me 20, 30 years to do one. <laughs> I'll be like 80 years old when I do two. <laughs> I'm enormously hopeful. Um, in 2005, in November, Liberia elected first female elected president of an African country. Um, Ellen Johnson's relief, and I think she sort of stands as this sort of model for women all around Africa. I mean, African women rock. African women carry that continent on their back. They are, they drive the economy. They, you know, they are the ones, they're there time and time again, and there, you know, there are these wars going on, and they're raped, and they're left in the, in the forest to have their children in the forest by these rapists, and they raise these kids, and they, you know, they pick themselves up, and they keep going, and I think she's an enormous, I mean, she's, she's, she's such, it's such a victory for African women to have, to have her there. I feel very hopeful. I mean, Liberia is still, is still post-conflict. We don't have a lot of electricity. There's still generators mostly. You know, there's no running water yet. There's, it's got such a long way to go. But for the first time, it's going, the, the direction is right. It's got, it's in a hole, but it's going the right way. When for so many years, we just, it was in a hole and it was digging deeper. And now it's in a hole and it's coming out. 
Thank you very much.